Okay. So, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because I know that people from all around have actually um, joined us today. Um, I will introduce myself. My name is Koko Adeleke, and I am the current pres president of Legacy, the historical and environmental interest group of Nigeria. And this webinar, this Legacy webinar today is part of our 25th anniversary series. Um, as you know, the webinar is um, titled Restitution, Time for Preparation. But actually, the t it was a much longer title, which we shortened. It, you, when we started out, it was Restitution, question mark. It was Repatriation, question mark. Reparations, question mark. Now is the time for preparation, exclamation mark. Anyway, the restitution debate over the return of looted Benin bronzes has moved significantly further. Um, new developments are happening almost every week. Um, there are so many institutions and museums who are pledging to return items. I um, mean, we have University of Aberdeen, National Museum of Ireland, um, the Pitt Rivers Museum, the Ethnological uh, Museum in Berlin, the University um, uh, of Bristol, Cambridge, and um, the Horniman Museum, There's so many. And, you know, it just goes on. However, beyond plans for a museum to be built in Benin to house them, there has been very little discussion about what this really means for the heritage sector. Very little analysis of what it means in the broader sense as a catalyst for change and action in Nigeria. In Europe, there's so much debate going on about the decolonization of you know, European museums but what about decolonizing our Nigerian museums that were modeled on those European ones? So beyond the return of artifacts, this should really be an opportunity for us to embrace our pre-colonial history. Um, so, you know, we ask these questions, is the return of treasures just the low hanging fruit? Is it mission accomplished? Or is it mission beginning? Mission beginning in Nigeria? I mean, how much do we know? How much do we actually know about pre-colonial sites and treasures that we have in Nigeria? Do we have national and local strategies on all this? So to address these issues, we have assembled a very strong panel. But before we start the discussion, and we're gonna have a question and answer session afterwards. And so if you have questions, you know, please write them in the chat. We will sort of allow for some people to ask some direct questions as long as they are kept um, quite short. And I would be grateful if everybody would actually keep on mute. Um, but the first thing that I need to do now is to introduce the panel. First of all, I would like to introduce Sheng Ajaguna. She is currently the program coordinator at the Legacy Restoration Trust. She was formerly um, a curator at Jekyll House coordinating legacy activities and she has been a research assistant at the Africa Studies Centre Oxford and she presently represents le legacies activities in the UK. So welcome to Shim. Next, I mean, and this person really needs no introduction at all, Prince Dr. Yemisi Shilon. Amongst many other things, he is Nigeria's largest private art collector and is amongst the world's top 100 private art collectors. He is a philanthropist and foremost patron of the arts in Nigeria. Since 2007, through the Omoba Yemisi Adedoyin Shilon Art Foundation, he has sponsored numerous art exhibitions, workshops, residences, and research projects. He was involved in the establishment of the Yemisi Shilon Museum of Arts at the Pan Atlantic University, which is Nigeria's first university art museum, to which he donated over 1,000 pieces of art. 
Next, so welcome to Dr. Shilong. Next, I would like to introduce um, Barrister Babatunde Adebi. He is the legal advisor for the Ni National Commission for Museum and Monuments. He is an expert on Nigerian laws for heritage protection and management. He has written extensively on this area and represented Nigeria internationally, including at UNESCO and the Benin Dialogue. He is a trustee of the Legacy Restoration Trust. And I would like to introduce, um, finally, Mr. Enoti Agbebo. He is an award-winning multidisciplinary disciplinary visual artist and authority on Benin culture, history and tradition and Benin court art. His works have been exhibited internationally and he has established an art studio to train young artists and provide a space for visiting artists to work. He is a member of the Benin Dialogue Group and is a trustee of the Legacy Restoration Trust. So um, I would like to welcome um, all of them. Um, so I think really we're going to go straight in with the questions. And I would like to start with Dr. Shillon. So Dr. Shillon, I hope, I hope that you are, you have been able to unmute yourself for this question now. Um, my question is, is it appropriate, is it correct for a thief who wants to return stolen goods to the rightful owner to ask the owner if they have the capacity to care for those goods? Well, I will not call those who took our works away as thieves because the international law at that time allowed many, many things to happen. And international law has been tightened and a lot of treaties have been entered into that makes us now look with hindsight. We want to blame, or to, we can continue to blame, but we should not um, insult those who took those works because of what they have done with those works over time. Many of us have had to pay monies to go and see those works well taken care of in those climes of those we quote to be thieves. But when we come home to, do, to our own selves and begin to ask ourselves, what have we done with our own? I think it will um, not be fair to call them thieves. Now, your question as to whether we should call those thieves, uh, we should celebrate them for what they have done. I would celebrate them in, with hindsight, I will condemn them, but with, with what I have observed in my few years on earth, with respect to how we treat those objects here, the kind of value we place on those objects, I will thank them for having held on those objects for, for some years and treating them well. Of course, the circumstances have changed. We are now in a position to want to run back our work. Those works were originally in palaces and in the house of nobles, and of course in shrines. We now have seen a new way by which, the, in quote, those thieves have treated those works and have created an expansive use and the value to those works. So we now yearn for those expansive use, those humongous values that have been placed around these works. Yes, in that light, we should uh, really thank them for returning our works. We should not condemn them, we should thank them, and we should see what we can do to ensure that the values of those works do not plummet after coming to to us, and that is where my concern is. I want to stop for now. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shilon. So my next question is for Barrister Adebi. We have been in bronzes in Nigeria with very, very interesting histories. Some of these been in bronzes have been much traveled. They're in Nigeria, they went abroad, they were brought back. Some of them have been stolen, some of them have been returned. They've traveled around quite a lot, very interesting stories behind these um, Benin bronzes. 
Um, now, my question is, do we have a complete list of what, in terms of the Binning Bronzes, what is in government museums? Is there a complete audit available to the public as a matter of record? That's my question to Barrister Adibi. Could Barrister Adibi unmute, please? Yeah, thank you for the question. Briefly, permit me to quickly talk about the issue of theft before I go to... Baris Adibi, have we lost him? Okay. Barry, so could you... Is he on mute? Sorry, okay. Okay, okay, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, I was just quickly and briefly talking about the issue of theft, whether those folks stole our antiquities. Well, I'm in support of Dr. Shiron to an extent, and this is my point of divergence now. Theft, as we know in the legal definition of theft as it is, is taking somebody's as property with intention to deprive him permanently of the goods in the item. So for many, I mean, the, at the point of taking these things away, agreed, international law was not existing in that sense then. I don't want to go into the deep, I mean, story about the international law that was existing, at least it bounced from European countries, but it was not existing, at least they didn't consider us nations then. But the moment we start asking that these things be returned, if they kept on depriving us, then it will now amounts to theft or conversion. However, in recent time, like we have all witnessed, these things are being returned now. So I think we can erase the idea of theft or stealing from the whole scenario, insofar as they now want to return these things. They are not permanently depriving us. But with our present knowledge of world affairs, if any nation insists, is still insisting on holding on to these items, that nation or museum will be committing theft or at least conversion. Then I will quickly go into the question that you asked about whether the Benin or Nigerian antiquities generally, but like with particular reference to the Benin, antiquities, the ones in Nigeria, whether we have a catalog, let me use a kind of expression, whether we have a list of them that we can lay our hands on immediately if demanded or required. Yes, you can say that. For the past 10 years in Nigerian museums, particularly with reference to Lagos Museum, we have been cataloging our items and we have been assisted by international bodies as well. Mind you, it is um, a requirement of international law, even based on the UNESCO 1970 convention, is that you cannot repatriate your antiquities if they didn't belong to a sort of catalog. And for the past 10, 15 years, you know, the Getty Foundation has aided, but I mean, it's free. All the museums can, I mean, apply the Getty standard to their, um, to their affairs. Some are downloaded, some you can go and collect the physical fashion. But the point is that you can use this as a basis of cataloging your items. So we have been doing that in the, I mean, particularly in the National Museum Lagos. Other museums don't have as many Benin objects as Lagos museums. For many years, we have always known where they are and how they are kept, and they have been kept safely. Well, the story is often told of the Benin items in George Museum that were stolen in 1987. I think that's why people think probably Nigerian antiquities are not properly kept, I mean, are not properly kept and are being lost. I think those days are past. And it's not, I'm just making reference to the Benin objects. It is, I mean, thieves 
highly distinguished when they rush into the museums to steal or whatever they steal. They don't say they are searching for a meaning object. Still, take them out. If they don't need them, probably they will dump them somewhere. What I'm trying to say is that as of today and for the past 10 years, our objects are probably are properly cataloged and we have identity for them and they are in pictures. And mind you, we will have a battle to take to bring back a, an Ife bronze. We have instituted the case already before the UNESCO ICP, RCP. And why we are so certain of instituting the case in the first instance, and now we are assured of winning the case, for example, is for the fact that we had a catalog even as far back as 1987. And we submitted this picture and identity of this object to the UNESCO. So now that this thing was stolen, and we finally found it with a Belgian, all what we needed to show in the Interpol and the British Museum, and the, I mean, sorry, the Metropolitan Police in the United Kingdom are the pictures of this object. And immediately they could identify this, they said, this is Nigerians. So that's why we could easily lay our claim. What I'm saying is that like, along the line, we have been cataloging our objects. Thank you. Okay, well, if I could just quickly come back to you on that question. I did ask that, okay, you said that we, we have catalogs. Is this, are these catalogs available to the public for people who want to see and want to know what the descriptions of these, these yeah. items? Because, yeah. You know, this, this is sort of a, a matter of sort of public record for us okay. to have access to these catalogs to know what they are and you know which items you know are in these various museums in Nigeria because we do know we have been in bronzes and other artifacts in Nigerian museums. Can a member of the public ask to see the catalog? Yeah, thank you. Very, very important question you have asked. You know, number one, like I said, apart from Lagos Museum, which has a lot of objects, other museums don't have this much. That is ready, you can get to the National Museum in Enugu and say, I want to see a Benin object. You can easily identify that. The ones in Jaws, the ones in Ibadan, few, you can identify this. If you are making reference to Benin objects, the ones in Lagos are many. Most are in the vaults, in the storage. You can ask for a purpose, for example, we even put now, you know, in the, I mean, Years back, we didn't permit people to go into the vault with us and all those things. It's not as we actually permit them, but, but very important reasons now, we may even permit you. For example, the Americans through the reorg, I, I, I mean, that's like a reorganization, but reorg of museum objects. It did not through the ambassador's fund. Of course, we let them in into these vaults. They helped us to reorganize the vaults to meet modern standards. And of course, by doing so, they were cataloging. Not stopping at that, even PPP arrangements, like for example, the group called Dias Fund, we made an MOU with them that they would take the pictures of all important objects. And most building objects are actually important objects. Most if objects are important objects for a start. And it's an ongoing process. If you check African, uh, WWW, African, history.org, safeafricanhistory.org, for example, you can just link to it now, safeafricanhistory.org. You will see pictures, digital, digital formats of these objects. For a start, it's an ongoing process. Okay. So at the end of it all, and then the new law of the NCMM, probably you are aware that we have a new law, before, I mean, with the National Assembly now. This law actually says by paying a fee, you can ask for any of these objects and you can take pictures. I mean, you can have pictures of these objects okay. by paying a fee, which is not existing in our, our extant art as it is now. Thank you. I think we, we might return to this subject of sort of um, the members of the public having access. Um, so um, the, the next um, question will be to Mr. Enotti. Um, the bin in bronzes, as we can see now, is a very, very topical question. I mean, subject area. Um, and recently, two very well-researched books have come out. There was one by Dan Hicks called The Brutish Museums, 
And there was another one by Bunmi Phillips called Loot. Now those were very, very well researched books, um, which I know that you are aware of. Now, by now, we would have expected, with all what's been going on, you know, in terms of having a, 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 an analysis of this from the Nigerian perspective, we would have expected Nigerian writers and academics to, to have been coming out with books on this, you know, sort of to document what is actually happening and, you know, how, how things have been uh, you know, uh, making progress, you know, people doing in-depth research. Um, but it seems as though we are still reliant on European research and investigations, even though we have so many um, museum, I mean, universities in Nigeria and academics. So could you, could you sort of, you know, do you have an idea why this, why this, why th this is the situation? Why we are still sort of relying on other people to write books about, you know, what's going on in Nigeria and, you know, Nigerian issues? E Enoti, would you, would you please um, unmute? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much um, for that very good question. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Chief Yemesi Shilong. I greet you, sir, and um, everybody else. Um, let me quickly say that um, the effects of colonialism um, and the effects of um, colonial education has to a larger extent hampered our thought processes when we are engaging with our culture our traditions and our history. As you know, colonialism brought um, um, religion, especially Christianity, and the new variant which is practiced today, um, which is the Pentecostalism, um, which is even more rabid than the <laughs> old um, religions, uh, old formats of Christianity, uh, which are the Catholic, the Methodist, the Anglicans, and so on and so forth has brought about a stigmatization of this culture objects as fetish, as juju. And so you find that uh, even when we are looking for research students, uh, PhD students to, you, to recommend for training with foreign institutions, we have a problem finding Nigerians who are studying history or even heritage uh, arts where a lot of them prefer to go and read anthropology. Uh, they won't read. Uh, and so, I mean, with, with the removal of history in our schools, um, that also truncated uh, the ability of a lot of people to develop interest in history and to follow it up as uh, a field of specialization. And um, of course, you know that um, our educational system also has not um, received the sort of uh, support uh, from government, which um, should have over the last 50 years. Um, the percentage of our, of our budget, which is allocated to education is paltry and inadequate to cater for so-called essential subjects like mathematics and science and all of that. And when you come to the humanities and the arts, there is uh, absolutely little or no support in this regard. And so with all these factors competing to uh, bring about this confusion, you have a situation where a lot of our scholars are looking for areas where they can easily get grants or focus on areas they feel they can receive support from. And so um, when you have an educational system that does not train you to be an independent and deep thinker, but merely to be one a scholar who passes exams, um, you, yeah, you find yourself in a situation where people cannot even um, think about world events, how they are unfolding, and the relevance of uh, unearthing certain facts in order to bring about a realization of our history, where we are, and where we should be going to. So, um, you can see a situation where uh, today with the global debate on restitution uh, and with the focus on Bini bronzes and the events in 1897 that led to it, one would have expected that um, Nigerian scholars or African scholars would have focused on these particular areas to um, bring to the public notice our perspective 
our perspective, as narrated and as told by us, from examining the available um, facts, documents, and even the oral tradition, in order to arrive at uh, a narrative which is from our perspective. So it's a failure of the um, educational system, of the government, and a failure on our side because uh, there's a focus on materialism, which uh, precludes a lot of people from thinking about venturing into these other areas, which are very beneficial to humanity and to us especially, who need to be reconnected to our history and to our heritage in a way that we see it as a legacy which has been bequeathed to us, uh, bequeathed to us by our illustrious um, ancestors. And for this to be adopted as a platform for us to build our society in a forward looking way. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, so I would like to continue with the questions and I'm going to, this next question is for Sheung. Um, to manage heritage, we need a wide range of people. We need historians, archeologists, anthropologists, conservationists, curators, designers, perhaps so many things, you know, so many, so many disciplines. And, and it takes up, it takes many years to build up expertise. You can't just sort of study something or graduate and then you become an expert. It takes a long time to build up a body of people who are really very, very professional. And so in your experience, do you think that the workforce capacity levels here in Nigeria are sufficient for a country with Nigeria's needs in terms of what's, what's on the ground at the moment? Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Mrs. Adeleke. At the moment, no. Uh, I'll just give a direct answer to that. We, we do not have that capacity yet. Uh, but on the bright side, the fact that we're having this conversation in the first place gives an indication that we, uh, we are beginning to get prepared for that. Um, and basically, again, it's just back to how um, the whole heritage um, uh, management uh, um, has been structured in Nigeria. Uh, we have more people that are, that have these experiences or, or capacity in the, in the, in the public set, uh, sector, that's for example, NCMM. And we've only just begin to see people uh, private museums and private um, NGOs like Legacy coming up now to do this sort of thing. Uh, so at the moment, we've not got that, but I believe that with, as we begin to have these conversations, as we begin to talk, people would, um, we would begin to prepare ourselves for this. And it won't be long. Um, I, I want to be optimistic about that, really. It won't be long um, to get to that point. The good thing about the heritage, uh, culture, tourism, whatever it is we want to call it, because we all have different terms for it, is that uh, apart from the core technical aspect of heritage preservation or management, You've, you're able to take skills from outside the industry and, and transfer into the heritage uh, sector. So I, I believe that um, Nigeria has a bit of that, that uh, transferable skills from other industries. And going from moving forward from now, um, I think that within the next two to three to five years, we can develop uh, manpower in that uh, in that area. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Shell. Okay, so I'm now going to go around to another round of questioning and I'm going to start um, again with Dr. Shillon. Um, I know that you had put a question in the chat, but I think we would like to come back to that when we do when we get to the Q&A. So the, the question I have for you now, um, are people ready in Nigeria to embrace our pre-colonial history. Are we ready 
to research traditional religious beliefs and practices that the Europeans encouraged us to despise. How do we remove all this fear associated with juju that stops people appreciating many of our art forms? Well, in answering your question, I want to first of all address some of the issues that have been raised. The issue of cataloging. Uh, my learned colleague talked about them having cataloged the Lagos Museum. The Lagos Museum was cataloged under a private sector led initiative. It was not the initiative of the National Commission for Museum and Monument. I was part of the management committee that worked with Ford Foundation to uh, uh, introduce electronic cataloging of the Lagos Museum. And if we want to grow the museum, uh, museum uh, in Nigeria, we have to look more into the private sector led initiatives and not rely on government and its institutions. Now, the second point that was raised was by um, Dr. Ugebo when he was talking about fetishness. I think that goes to answer some of the questions, the question you have raised. So I will not dwell too much about that, but I will only say that it is not only the Christians, uh, Dr. Ugebo, that are uh, looking at it in terms of fetish, fetishness. The Arabs also look at our culture and our ethnographic and archaeological objects as fetish. Indeed, I want to um, tell you that in one of, in one of the international conferences for which I partook, I raised this question about religion being one of the major challenges to the development of museums and the attitude of our people to, um, uh, to cultural objects. And surprisingly, one of the senior members of the National Commission for Museum and Monument who was present, agreed with me that in their language, I will not mention the language, museum is interpreted as house of juju, house of juju. And I sat down there wondering if your culture takes my ethnographic and the storage of my ethnographic and archaeological objects as house of juju, then what are you doing there as one of the elders of that um, of that outfit of the national commission for museum and monument now also um capacity the issue about capacity was was um, raised the problem is don't let us deceive ourselves we are only clamoring for those works to be returned we do not have the capacity to receive the work because to start with you don't even we, we don't even know we don't we don't have a catalog of the quantity of those works that are out there. We don't know their numbers. We don't know. We are just expecting people to say, I will give you 50, I'll give you 30. This same country, a minister received um, um, a terracotta work uh, don't, uh, returned by a German family. And they said it was 600 years. No, we don't have the carbon dating machine for such. We don't have Tamulusen's dating machine. We're just talking and talking and talking. I was involved in the management committee for the Lagos Museum. And we were ready to put down 350 million Naira. And we asked government to give us 750 million Naira for us to buy Tamulusen's dating machines and carbon dating machine. What happened to that initiative? Of course, the late Taiwan Adero who led us, we, 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 we as private sector, uh, people were prepared to look for the funds. That was the end of it. So if we want to do anything about the return of those works, we must ensure that it is private sector led and not government. Now, let me go to your question. Are, we, are our people prepared to raise our culture? I just came back from a, from a meeting uh, from a place yesterday and I did a sample analysis. I asked them, how many of you have been to any Nigerian National Museum? The answer was generally, yes, when we were kids, we were taken there uh, as children. I said, since you've been an adult, how many times have you been there? The answer is no. I have had visits from different parts of this country. And I always ask them that question. 
how many times have you been to any of the Nigerian National Museum? The problem is, is very multifarious. One of them is the fact that under our statute books, we have what we call the repugnancy doctrine. And that repugnancy doctrine has been used over the years during colonization and thereafter, where he says our customs, our traditions have to be measured in, as against natural justice, equity, and good conscience. And I keep asking, where is the natural justice? On which, on which measure do we measure natural justice? On which measure do you measure uh, equity? On which measure do you measure uh, good conscience? So the problem is we have been, we have been, we have been re indoctrinated. I took back in a, in a, I took part in a international Zoom conference. And one of the Nigerians based in America uh, told me that I'm a black African. I said, I am a black. I said, I'm not a black. I am not black. I am an African. There is no white man anywhere in the world. You have Asians, you have Indians, you have uh, Japanese and so on. In Africa, we have Sub-Saharan Africa and we have uh, the other part of Africa. So the problem is we have been, we have been indoctrinated to hate who we are, not to embrace who we are. We have been indoctrinated to ignore who we are. We have been indoctrinated to, to celebrate what they are and not what we are. And so as we grew up, we distance ourselves away from our culture, our cultural objects. We distance ourselves away from our archaeological objects. And many of us are pretending to be part, to be part of um, a system of um, uh, theologizing uh, what others are theologizing. The truth is that our people are not ready. We need a real mass reorientation for our people to believe, to embrace, to, 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 to value what, what those uh, cultural objects represent. Those cultural objects represent our unique identity. Those cultural objects represent our history. Those cultural objects represent our civilization. Those cultural objects represent our traditions and our customs. And there are deep values around those, those um, unique identity, uh, 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 those elements of unique identity of, uh, of our people. So I want to stop there, please. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you very, very much. Um, so the next um, question that I have, I'm going to direct to Mr. Enyoti. Um, This is about the proposed museum in Benin. Now, I understand that it was originally going to be called maybe the Royal Museum or the Obas Museum or something like that. And then the name was changed to the Edo Museum for West African art. So I want to ask you whether you know why the name was changed. Was it to make it more broader? And in that case, if that is so, is there a case for Benin bronzes that are being returned to be held in other museums within Nigeria? Because I think we might be getting to a situation where, okay, if this is um, um, the culture that comes from one part of Nigeria, then it belongs to them and this the affairs uh, stuff belongs to people in that area so I don't know what you you think of, of, about this new museum and who it's for and you know how it should how it should be run well thank you very much um, for that um, question um, let me say that um, the concept of um, museums in the world, especially in the Western part of the world, um, is that they were built as bastions to celebrate the collection of um, trophies or artifacts from all over the world uh, as a celebration of the success of their imperialism. And so coming back home, where in Africa, we have always, no, the our environment was our museum. Um, our shrines were not kept away from view. They were part of the architectural layout. Um, our works were used to adorn walls. 
They were used to tell history. They were part of our lives. It was a living concept. And so in coming back to um, developing museums in modern day Nigeria and 21st century, it's only correct that we think about these museums as places where we can tell stories um, from our perspective so that people can, you know, um, come to terms with who we are. These museum spaces ideally today should be spaces where these works when returned can be put and displayed in their proper context because a lot of them, if not all of them, were decontextualized when they were removed um, from their original places, um, from where they were looted. Now, in today, um, the value of these objects as objects of art, as objects of heritage, uh, mean different things to different cultures. But one thing that's agreed is that they are now valuable works of art. For us, it's an extension or a repository of our heritage, of our history. And so in displaying them, um, the Edo Museum of West African Arts, particularly, um, is being designed as part of a cultural quarter and a place where both heritage and modern art and performance and all of these other elements which make up the art and heritage sector can be displayed. After all, um, what will be uh, our culture without our music? What is our culture without you know, other drama? And as you know, today, artists in Nigeria are still producing very valuable works of art. Uh, and so you have heritage art, and then you have the contemporary art, which is being churned out till this day. And so instead of building a museum that is seen as a place where old artifacts are kept in dusty environments, I mean, that's the picture that is painted basically with the state of a lot of the museums in Nigeria. Uh, and that is why a lot of people do not go to these places because they do not um, have um, the kinds of um, uh, ambience that is inviting to successive generations. And so EMOA, the Edo Museum of West African Arts, is being conceptualized as a place where all these various aspects can converge and as a place where a space that can be shared by all demographics in the society and as being a part of a larger cultural quarter which is being uh, created in the heart of the city. And so in looking at the extent of the Benin Empire and its history, and the fact that it's now part of a federation, um, and it's part of a region, the West African region is seen somewhat as a cultural uh, headquarters of Africa. And so uh, the idea is to build an institution where all these cultures can be displayed. Um, um, so they can tell a story of a continent, of a people, and the legacy which has been bequeathed to us by our illustrious ancestors. Um, so it's also going to be an institution where a lot of the archives and the knowledge which has been garnered over the years from the research of these objects can be warehoused. So that researchers can come and have access to a huge volume of, um, of um, archives of information. Um, we also have a situation where um, a lot of uh, artificial intelligence, um, digitalization will occur. I do not know uh, if you are aware that there's a project which has already been undertaken with um, the, under the EMOA auspices and with the German um, museums called Digital Benin, where Benin works across the globe are being digitized. Uh, the provenances are being also ascertained so that this can be put in the cloud. So people can have access to this information from any part of the world. These archives will also be warehoused eventually in um, the EMOA Museum. This museum is being designed um, 
as an institution um, according to global best practices so that in terms of security, in terms of preservation, in terms of exhibition, in terms of display, it's going to be uh, according to a global best practice. So this gives the assurance that when these works are returned, um, they will be well preserved, they will be well conserved, they will be well protected security wise, and then they will also be displayed according to uh, global best practices, which we will redefine because we're going to recontextualize these works um, to show them in their original um, um, format and to be able to tell the stories in an authentic manner. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next question I have is for Barrister Adebi. Um, there is a huge push now for independent museums. We have the Yemisi Shilon Museum. There's going to be a new Yoruba History Museum and we have the new Benin Museum. How is this going to affect our already deteriorating government museums? Because when I hear about all these new museums coming up and what's happening, I just wonder what is going to happen to our government museums? And could, you, I mean, I mean, a lot of people are saying now that the only way forward is, you know, independent, privately run museums. I mean, it, are there any benefits, real benefits of having museums that are run by the government for the, for the public? I mean, how do you feel about this push for independent privately owned museums? Thank you. Thank you for this question. You asked whether there are benefits for having national museum in that sense. I mean, I'll just put it in that manner. Yes, there are benefits to this. The idea of culture, the idea of a museums is an ideal. It's not just, you know, this, this is something that you can use to move a nation from one point to another. Culture serves that purpose. So when you build a museum, when the national body builds a museum, or the state government as well has a museum, you know, what you put there is to tell a story. You use it to unite a nation sometimes. In periods of despondency, like we are witnessing in Nigeria, what I expect national museums to be exhibiting now are things that will unite us. This is not just the time to show things about um, some dance steps and whatever, some mask, some regalia, whatever. That is why you have a nation. That's why you have national museums. Not just in Nigeria, even in Europe, you tell a story that you want to present to the world and to your people, something that will move them to unity. That is one reason why we will always have national museums. Number two, the ideas of having private museums. A pity that our new law is not in the, it's not in public view yet, but I humbly request as many interested persons as possible should come to the hearing at the National Assembly. We will send you invitations and I'll try to keep records of everybody listening now so that we can send personal invitations. We have made provision and Number one, let me quickly say something. I thank you for the assemblage here today. This panel is studied. Let me use that kind of expression. I will quickly go back a tiny bit. Thank you, Dr. Yemisi Shilon, for your efforts with the Ford Foundation cataloging. That was about eight, 10 years ago. And we still have the, I mean, the effect is still here with us today. Number, but after that, the Americans came, the real that I talked about, and then the PPP that was mentioned here as necessary. For example, Dallas Fund. Now, when you now say, what's the relevant, I mean, what about private museums? Yes. Our new law that is before the National Assembly now encourages as many private museums as possible. All what we need to do is to regulate. Then we, permit what we call community museums. 
whereby communities can even have, if they can only exhibit photographs of their, you know, leaders, previous leaders, it's okay with us. We will encourage them. We may not be able to help them with funds, but setting it up and things, we will always do that. We now encourage palace museums. That is why you see the Emma of Potiscom in a Yobe State, starting a palace museum. Two months ago, I was in Okene to start the same process with the Hoinoi of the Ebiras. We are starting a palace museum with the Ebira folks. Other places are asking for this. So palace museum, community museum, private museum, and specialized museums. We even encourage schools that are older than 50 years to start museums and we will help them. Just to tell, you, to tell you that like the idea of private museums have come and we are going to support all this. Then if I'm not going to digress for too long, I will just say that in reference to what we have, uh, we have discussed before, I'm about Shinon. Dr. Shinon was saying that, you know, he was a bit concerned about this returning antiquities, that we are not ready to, I would say we are now getting ready. His museum can house some of these things. It's not a joke, this is a fact. What he has done is, I mean, of international standard, we respect him, we love what he has done. This is the beginning. If other than years, the wealthy men had been doing this, the wealthy men and women had been doing this over the years, we would have gone beyond this. And see what is starting in um, what I know has just discussed about Benin, what we are starting in Benin City. If this had happened years back, it would have been splendid. We would have gone, gone beyond this. Then, you know, what the Europeans and many people that would, we would we've been discussing with about returning our antiquities, I've always raised as a point of concern is the fact that we would not have places to you know, put these things because of security, like I noticed said. Yeah, that is a fact. Uh, I wrote about this in 2009. Probably you have come across the book, I wouldn't know, talking about books, whether we don't write about books. I think this is a good point to just refer to it. Legal and other issues in repatriating Nigerian looted antiquities. I think it's on the next as well. Point is that we address this issue. We even told them that, I mean, I personally wrote that they could as well establish a museum in Abuja, Nigeria, for example, to meet their standard of universal museum. I believe you know, I mean, we are probably familiar with this phrase, universal museum. So certain museums claim to be the universal museums of the world, British museums, and, and, and British Museum, Metropolitan Museum, and the like. Then you could as well establish one in Abuja here so that we can have our antiquities here. Today now, we are all establishing one in Benin City. So that's the Universal Museum of Africa. And the, as luck will have it, it is being established in Benin City. So I will just say that we are prepared in a way. What we are discussing here today, I'm not too certain that we've, that people had ever taken the pain to enlist this kind of discussants to have, to, to think of the future of what should happen with these antiquities. If we had been doing this years back, probably other means of retaining these antiquities, whether we are going to warehouse them and other things. And this little suggestion that I said I made in 2009 in a book I wrote, which today now we are seeing it in physical form, and many other things, is exchanging of views that will bring most of these things about. So, everybody, briefly, Dr. Shino, if I'm not going to take your, I mean, sorry for taking your time, about the terracotta that was repatriated from the Netherlands. Actually, I went there, so it's like, I've, I have to, it's a, what do you call it now? It's like, a, almost like a legal case, like an arbitration panel to win over an antiquity. Leiden Museum and the British Museum officials were there. We don't have the facility. And it's a pity that Nigeria does not have this facility to even date a museum piece or an archaeological object. Point is that British Museum and 
University of Leiden, the Museum of University of Leiden, had tested this and confirmed that it was between 600 and 800 years in age. We, trying to be modest about the affair, since we don't have the facility, have always used the lesser, I mean, the, the, the lesser years, that is 600 years. We don't claim to be, to, I mean, that it's 800 years or 700 years. We have always limited ourselves to 600 years. So that in, in future, nobody will say, oh, you claim that this thing is 800 years and we are discovered as 600. But that is, by the way, we don't have the facilities, but we work with the nations that have the facilities. And sir, I wish this opportunity that you provided or you assisted with, or you intended to assist with years back, that is, there was about 350 million naira or something, and then 600 and something million naira, if it were added, we will have, had, we will have the opportunity of uh, thermal lucens and all those things here in Nigeria. <laughs> if this opportunity should come today, notwithstanding that Nigeria is facing, I mean, some dire straits financially, I think it will work now. Why? Hardly would you see a government official speaking this much. I would rather even avoid this kind of discussions. But now, freely, we want you to come in. We bring PPP. We beg. We participate in discussions just to make sure that if such opportunities should ever come, we will need to, of course, everything you do in government, you have to put it in the budget. We now know what we are working towards against the next year. If there had been a bit of lethargy years past, Sincerely, I'm telling you, that lethargy is gone. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think at this point, it would be a, um, a good idea for me to bring um, Dr. Shilong in because my next question is really, what is required before government museums or other museums can attract large scale funding from the Nigerian private sector? I'll repeat that again. If, what is required before government museums or other museums in Nigeria can attract large scale funding from the Nigerian private sector? Because we know there is money in Nigeria. People do have money. But how can museums attract it from the Nigerian private sector? Well, let me start by thanking my learned uh, colleague. Um, you, you represented your national equity. Uh, question originally, if there, there can be private museums, we need national museums, even if... Okay, I think, I think, um, I think um, Dr. Shilon... Hello, I didn't go I'm up. Back. I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm back. back. Okay, you're back. Yeah. Okay. We need, we need national museums. We should stop pretending that once we set up private museums, we don't need national museums. We need national museums. But I will suggest that owners of national museums or the trustees of the national museum, I mean, because they are, they are trustees, whether government or individual, the trustees of the national museum to gradually disengage from the daily, daily management of national museums and begin to incorporate private sector-led initiative in the management of those museums. He referred to other countries of the world, but I can tell you, I have been to over 60 countries of the world, exploring the culture and the heritage of these countries. And I can tell you that even in, in uh, communist China, they allow um, inputs into their national museums. They create policies and regulations. They create environments and um, lead the private sector in a particular productive um, direction. So uh, that's what I want to say. I commend um, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Barista Debi for what is um, what he has, what they are doing. Um, we are looking forward to those new laws. Some of us have been waiting for our certificates for, for, for donkeys come. I hope the certificate will come uh, because this is part of the problem of the pro of, of the of government of government running um, the sector. 
um, private sector initiative are not encouraged. They are very difficult to private sector initiative. Um, so let me now answer your question. You ask me about what are the things that needs to be done to attract large scale traffic to our museums. First of all, our museums as they stand today are completely removed from the ordinary man on the streets. There are very few activities that engage the ordinary man on the street. They encourage school children to go. Some of them don't have enough sense to appreciate what is there. And when they go, do they, use, do, they, do, they, do they establish systems whereby those children can use their hands? They can draw, they can appreciate objects good enough. I think they should come and learn uh, about how to do it from the Yemen Shiloh Museum. Uh, we have a private sector um, uh, institution that is helping us to fund that initiative. Children are coming from public schools. We are giving them worksheets, not just visit. This one is made by, this one is the Benin, this one is the Ife. No, let them draw, let them draw their own impression of these objects and then begin to ask them, what have you drawn? So we need, we need something that is more hands-on than, than what we are doing now. Secondly, like I said, we are far removed from the public. No conferences, no journals are published by these museums. No conferences. We do not. Make, we do not. Uh, um, we should establish journals, for instance, online journals. And what is wrong in the National Commission for Museum Management opening a virtual museum of the content of what is the national, uh, the national museums? We need the, let the public know what is there and the process, educate the public. Let them know that there is nothing demonic about these subjects. Let them know that it's part of our identity. Let them know that these objects represent the forms of government of our people. Let them know that these objects represent the economic system of our people. Let them know that these objects represent the social organization of our people, and so on and so forth. Not, not to look at it from the religious angle. And what is more? Religion is a means of communication with God in different languages. If I was an Indian, my religion would be Hinduism. If I was a Chinese, my religion would be Buddhism. If I was an Arab, my religion would be, would be Muslim. What is all this mess about religion, religion, religion? Our forefathers had their ways of communicating with God Almighty in different names. Just like the Hinduists, called God Almighty Brahma, and they have different names for God Almighty Shivu, and so on and so forth. And they have 113 gods under God Almighty. So also does my forefathers have manifestations of God Almighty. And we don't have religion, we have spiritual beliefs. And those spiritual beliefs arose from our interaction with our environment. It arose from our interaction with nature. We conquered nature and survived. And in the process, we developed some beliefs, some of which have over time been trans transmitted as spiritual beliefs. We had our own philosophers who ended up becoming pantheons that we now look up to as representations of God Almighty. So we need to do more than that. We need to get the private sector. I don't see why national museums cannot call but a, a partner bank, I call it a day, one day or one week, guarantee trust week. Guarantee trust week. And go and talk to guarantee trust and tell them, look, we want to use your image to promote what we are doing and to let people know that we are not fetish people, that this is not a house of juju. So we want your staff to come and we will record your presence. We, our people will tell you about what these objects are all about. You can have Nigerite week, you can have Cadbury week, and of course, in the process, you generate funds. You can have non, you are, you are running museums, you don't have boards, private sector boards that will help you drive your museums. You are having civil servants, those at the top, and then below are 
Magrido, Magrido theorem uh, um, employees. So we need we need more active, more participative um, um, programs by our different national museums that will let that will remove this veil. There's a veil, a veil of fetishness. There's a veil or a veil of, you know, something that should be ignored. We need to develop activities. Now, if you National Museum need more advice, I will be ready to give you advice as a marketing consultant. I was I was the president of the National Institute of Marketing, and I know I, I, I know a lot about marketing, and I run marketing, a, a multinational marketing organization. So if you need more advice, I will give you. But let me end by saying that. We need to create industries for our culture. There is a big industry behind what you are sitting, Mr. National Commission for Museum and Monument. There is a big industry around it. Those people who have been reluctant to return those industries, they, reluctant they were making a lot of money from those objects. America, by the end of 2018, on, you can Google it under the World Tourism and Travel um, Council, and under the World, World Bank. America generated um, $1.6 trillion from tourism. China generated $1.5 trillion from tourism. Um, uh, France generated $385 billion from tourism. Our country generates less than $50 billion from petrol. This is a big industry that will create employment, that will create foreign exchange. We are sitting on gold and people want to see these things. But well, we are keeping those objects in the hands of people who know nothing about it. That is the problem. And until we get people who are competent, who know what to do with those objects, we are wasting our time. Otherwise, those objects will lose their value when they come to Nigeria eventually. Their values will plummet because I challenge you, go to their storages where they keep those objects. Many of them don't even visit the museums because they see it as house of juju. That is the that is the short answer to my question. Thank you. Okay, thank thank you very very much for that, Dr. Shilon. Now the plan now is we um, I, we are going to have a question and answer session, but I do actually have one more round of questions for the panelists. So I would like to now ask the panelists that when I ask these questions, if you can just give short answers to these to the final round of questions so that we can then quickly go to questions and answers. So please, panelists, just short answers to these final, this final round of questions that I'm going to give you. Now, I'm going to go to Sheon. Um, so Sheon, from your experience, what changes need to be made in schools and universities so that people, more people are prepared to work in the heritage sector? because history, anthropology, and archaeology, they are often not the first choice courses for studies. Because when I you know, talk to students, it's often because they couldn't get into another course that they end up doing archaeology or anthropology or history or something like that, because their parents don't want them to study that because they think it's a dead end subject. So just give me a short answer on, on what you think on that area. Uh, thank you, Mr. Adeleke. First of all, I will just um, highlight one of the uh, key problems that uh, Dr. Shillan had said, and it's about value. Um, us not valuing ourselves, not valuing who we are. Um, and that is the first thing. Um, and that's what schools from, from nursery level up until the university level, that is what we should be um, teaching children, teaching ourselves, how do we value ourselves? Uh, how do we value what we have uh, and what we produce as a people? And once that is in us as children and as we grow up, we would not have the issue of um, what costs to study and then fall back to history or anthropology as, as last resort. Um, and then over the years as well, I think that because of the fact that, okay, for some people that actually did go to the university to study these courses, when they came out, they did not find places to work in. So that was another issue. I went to university studying history and that was what I wanted to do, even though it was just 
because of the fact that I just love stories. And, uh, but coming out of university, I was just, I think I was one of the very lucky people in Nigeria that came across legacy and then found myself as a curator. Um, I do not think that people that I went to school with, my classmates from the university, I, I do not remember any of them doing anything within my industry. So that's another thing, there, there's, no, there's no outlet. So people come out of these schools and there are no outlets. And this is why I'm optimistic, but having private museums coming out now, um, I'm happy to hear um, 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 Mr. Babatune talking about a PPP, going out to get a uh, private sector. I'm happy uh, Chief Shilon is also talking about the private sector. But the thing here for me is collaboration. How do we collaborate? The private sector, the national museums uh, collaborating in, in, in this area. Uh, there were some other things that we had talked about that I would like to add to it. And uh, is the issue of when we're talking about publications. You would be surprised, Mrs. Adeleke, the amount of people that have written things in Nigeria, but there's no platform. There is no publishing opportunity. So we're doing research here and we're looking for things to write about and we go online. Normally you should be able to do some level at least an 80 percent DEX research online to find things. And then you find that you're, you're struggling to find things that Nigerian have written. And then later on, you're talking to colleagues here and then there's, oh yeah, somebody wrote this professor, this wrote that. And I'm like, where is it? It's not online. And this is something that Shishila has just said now, online journals, why is it so difficult to find research, Nigerian research by Nigerians? online. Everybody does their project on a computer. Why then would you come to me to say, oh, I don't have a soft copy of my work? People will tell you, oh, it's only on hard copy. And then again, like I said, the publishing opportunities, people have written, but they cannot approach publishing houses to publish their books. So there again, uh, there, I'm sure there's somewhere, somewhere has a book somewhere, it's just packing dust and all of that. So moving on to um, schools, universities, we just need to change our curriculum as well to uh, cater for the current uh, wave that we have right now. Um, again, private sector coming in to um, be part of this. We can also collaborate with international organizations, uh, institutions, ac academic uh, institutions. Um, NCMM, here again, you can also have, I know that for private Chief Sheila would not be, um, not be uh, supportive of this, but I think that for an institution that has, whole, has, has been in existence for many 50 years, I, I want to believe that there are some people within the institutions that can actually teach. NCMM can have an institute of some sort of training, some expertise. It doesn't have to be everything, even if it's just one thing. And they do it and do it very well. Um, yeah, collaboration, collaboration, partnerships, all of these new museums coming up, I think we should also begin to partner, begin to discuss, have this, this conversation. And one more thing, I'm hoping that this webinar that we have would be recorded, not just as a video, but written out where we can then go to Legacy 1995 website and download a report and we can refer to it every now and then. Okay, thank you thank very you. much, Phil. That, that was a very good point. So as I said, we're going to have Q&A, but I just have quest short questions again. And so please, um, panelists, please, can you just give very, very short answers to these questions so that we can get to the Q&A? So Mr. Enotti, um, the, this next question is for you. The people who have been doing the most um, to uh, celebrate, recognize, and keep alive our pre-colonial history are artists. How can artists 
work more closely with museums and other institutions to improve interpretation, bring in new audiences and engage, you know, sort of wider local participation on heritage issues. So please, could you just give a very short answer to that? Because we want to get to the question and answer after this. Sorry, could you unmute, please? Could you, could you unmute? We can't hear. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So all over the world, um, artists um, always collaborate with museums to respond either to their collections or to, you know, um, introduce some new narratives. And so this is usually uh, funded by either the museum through grants or from private sector um, initiatives. And so um, for Nigeria, um, since the museums are sort of like monolithic in the, the monolithic in the sense that they are all owned by the federal government and therefore uh, subject to limited funding, um, we have a situation where um, these institutions are being run as prostatals. And so they just cannot provide this sort of support actively. And so um, in line with every, what everybody has suggested, PPP, private partnerships and all of that can bring about these kinds of possibilities. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you so much, um, Enoti, for keeping that short and sweet. Um, so um, Barista Adebi, if you also could give a very short, sweet, you know, answer to this question, if you could. We, we've been talking about, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things I really have to say is that I've found that even people who are working within the um, heritage sector are often not aware of the latest discussions that are going on. You know, people within, you know, national museums in Nigeria are not really aware of these conversations that we're having, not to talk of the um, you know, the, the general public. And, you know, obviously it looks from here that we really do need leadership. We need, we need guidance. We need, we need uh, the right, where does this right direction come from to improve things? Just a, a very short answer, please. Where, where do we get this leadership from? Where should it be coming from? The guidance and the, you know, the direction. Okay. We anticipated this. Art is part of Whoever has art in them, you cannot force somebody to love the art. All of us discussing here are taking our time discussing because intrinsically art is in us, culture and, oh, I mean, art is in us. So it's somebody from here and similar fora that can be, that can offer leadership and others will toe the line. And we anticipated this because section 21 of the new law, which is before the National Assembly, answers your question, hopefully, and what Dr. Shilom proposed. He mentioned that there should be like trustees to, I mean, to our arts, our museums from the private sector. We already provided for that. Time will not permit me to read that section to you because I actually have it close by. We said people that are not, you know, somebody mentioned about civil servants being the people controlling or at least handling, I mean, parasitas and all those things concerning arts. We shouldn't be. We now said certain people from outside will be self-appointing. They will appoint similar people to them. We are not going to make them to. So I can imagine if Dr. Shillon appoints somebody that he knows really loves art, and if a evaluation guy is there, I, don't, I mean, similar people, I mean, people sitting in this panel today and people listening, participating in this discussion today, because you're not just here because you just want to be here. Something in you loves art, loves culture. Such people are not coming to it because of the money they want to make in this sector. They want to really contribute. So we now say this self-appointing group will constitute the trustee for culture and heritage, that's what we call it. They are not expecting anything from us, but they will be using, if possible, funds and connections to even help with repatriation. So this is already contained in it. So, but maybe when we come to the defense, we'll get to know more about this. I mean, when we come to the National Assembly at the readings, we'll get to know more about this. So sincerely, let us 
prop people that are really interested in art and culture out. So what is going on in Edo State? It was not so. A previous regime was demolishing monuments there. I'm not political now. So let me just put a full stop at this, that if we could do what we are doing in Edo, if Dr. Shilon could do what he's doing there in Lagos, and other people are doing similar things, if the amount of what is come can do what he's doing there, and the Oinoi of Ibrahim is doing what he's doing, then there's future. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So the, my final question for the panelists now is to Dr. Shilon. And again, if you could just maybe give a, a shorter answer as possible so we can get to the questions and answers after this. My question to you, Dr. Shilon, is do you think that all the talk about the Benin bronzes is overshadowing other important historical matters? Because Ibadan, Ilorin, Bida, and so many other places in Nigeria suffered destruction and looting of treasures in the 19th century, also by British punitive expeditions. But we don't really hear so much of all that. I mean, so are these worthy of future research and investigation? The say, a journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. I want to commend those behind Benin projects. It is easy to criticize, but it's more difficult to do. So I want to commend them. If they succeed, it will be the John the Baptist for the greater things to come with the other treasures that we have. So I think that we should support the Benin project as much as we can. If they seek advice, we should give them in our little, um, you know, uh, shallow mind. And if they seek any way by which we can, uh, we can assist, let us do so. Because all is in the interest of our nation, our people, our civilization, our culture, and so on and so forth. I can assure you that once we succeed with Benin, others will happen. Just like I've always said, the Yemisi Shilom Museum, which I solely funded, and I am still funding the operation of that museum personally, um, is going to give back to others that will come. And I'm happy, I want it to happen. I don't want to be the only one. So I can assure you the same thing will happen with the Benin. Okay. We have we lost the project. Okay. It will it will give back to other other projects from the oh. objects that are since lost returning to Nigeria. That's my short answer. Thank you. Okay, I, thank you very much. Continue. So right, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Femke so we can go straight into the question and answer session. Thanks so much, everyone, panelists, for your um, interesting inputs. And thank you, everyone else, for hanging on. Um, I know we're overrunning our time a bit. Uh, I'm going to make this short uh, and sweet. I've boiled down uh, the questions in the chat to more or less four questions, and we'll each direct them to one individual panelist. Um, and I will start, would like to start with Barrister uh, Adebi. Um, uh, coming back to um, the amendment, the 2018 am amendment um, of the law for the National uh, Museums and Monuments Commission. Um, first of all, well, there's two questions boiling down what was being asked in the chat, two questions. When is this law going to be um, uh, voted on because it's been there for quite a while. And the second one, since we don't want to write off uh, national museums uh, entirely, as uh, Dr. Shilon said, what are the provisions in these, um, in that amendment that the national uh, museums will be ready and to not just um, receive those returned objects, but also to uh, preserve them and conserve them. Barrister Adebi.
Hello, thank you very much. The first question is the position of the NCLM Act. Well, I mean, how far we've gone with it? Well, it is in the National Assembly. Well, it so happened that we've had change of administration here rather too often. But four chief executives or five chief executives within a span of two years or three years or something. Two years, I think. So, of course, there's been a, a sort of law. It's not our fault. No, no, no. But there, now we have sir. a new chief executive. There is yes, we have a new chief short. executive. Sorry to cut you short. You invited right. us for a hearing. So is there actually a hearing planned already? At the yeah. Assembly? OK, when is yeah. that going to be? Yeah. Um, as soon as we are certain, if we can exchange email addresses, I have a few email addresses here, but if I can have more, or oh, through the Legacy 95, 1995, I can always send this across so that as many people will participate. Sorry, a uh, bit of funding by yourselves, no provisions for that. But now we have a new chief executive, Professor Abba Isa Tijani, who is working towards this assiduously. So it's going to be very soon, and we are going to communicate this. Please, I didn't get the other question right. Could All you right. please repeat it? Yes, I'm sorry. Let me repeat it. Um, as um, uh, Dr. Shilon urged us not to write off national museums altogether, and there was one of the participants who asked, how are they prepared to receive and conserve the returned uh, art and artifacts? I was wondering how the new amendment assures, for example, better funding and a better positionment of those uh, national museums for that. And please uh, be sure Thank to you. your answer. Thank you. I, OK. The question is how we're going to receive these returned antiquities and whether there are enough funding to make it possible to receive them and to make our museum even function better. Yes, what, through this new law, okay. yes, through this new law, which we pray that we all help to come and support because if this caliber of people here should come to the national assembly to explain why things ought to be done in this manner i think things will flow for example from lottery funds a percentage will be coming to heritage protection that is the ncmm indirectly so then when we conduct archaeological reconnaissance that is all this um, heavy earth moving industries that uh, build dams and roads and whatever bridges, a percentage of their income or from the contract will be coming a very tiny percentage, but a bit of this here, a bit of that there, when added, it's something. All these are sources of funds for the for heritage protection, particularly the NCMM now. So other sources. Of course, now there is a provision, clear provision encouraging PPP, public private partnership. Then we encourage, like Professor and Dr. Shilon mentioned, we encourage I mean, corporate bodies to invest in museums. When you invest, a certain percentage of your tax billings will be taken off by the government just by you investing. Now Many other lofty, let me say lofty ideas about generating funds are in this law. However, of course, many will stand strange to some of these people in the National Assembly at the first instance, but nothing is novel. All these things are taken from the laws of other nations. Right. No Thank country you. in Europe Thank does not take from large reforms. Yes. Thank so you. we Thank expect you, so you, please, to come and support us. But Thank you so much, uh, Barrister Adibi. If I understand it correctly, there are provisions for uh, more funding, but part of them comes from uh, some tax um, uh, deduction possibilities. Of the law. And part of them. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, a big focus also on those public private partnerships. I'm sure many of us will be interested to come uh, once there is a date, and I'm sure everybody agrees that that should be sooner rather than later. Thank you so much uh, for your answer. Let me move on 
to uh, Dr. Shilon, who has already offered um, to be a marketing consultant on this. And this is why I want to ask him the question that he already um, sort of uh, touched on, the tourism possibilities of all those things that uh, will be returning. And um, let's make it very, very concrete, uh, per, uh, Dr. Shimon, if you want. Um, what three things could you think of, knowing marketing, knowing the, the, the art market also, but also um, knowing tourism the way you know it, that you could think of that would be um, Columbus eggs when it comes to drawing tourists to Nigeria and to the museums and to the artifacts? Well, under marketing theory, when you have things like this, you should look at uh, creating the ambience, ambience that will attract people to your product. The ambience of the national museums in Nigeria, we need to do a lot about it. And we need to create activities that would attract people's interest. Activities that have events that will, while well, we draw attention beyond just the objects, but Dr. something Shiro, much more than that. Could you give yes. us an example? I know you are a man with a big imagination. Could you give us an example of such a, an activity? Yes, I will tell you one. I was a guest to the Newark Museum in uh, New Jersey. And they were busy doing, they have an educational unit. And their educational unit is to train children and adults in understanding what museum is all about and so on and so forth. And this training is, com is highly uh, uh, communicated to the private sector. So please come in and key into such trainings for the good of the next generation of um, people in New Jersey. That's, that's an example I'll give you. Secondly, I'll give you an example. At Metropolitan Museum, I was a guest of the American Department of State in 2009. And because I was a guest of government, I went to see the, 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 the then Director General and I asked him, how do you fund this museum? And he told me that Metropolitan Museum will not be, will not be able to stand if they don't have volunteers. Volunteers are people who have retired, who do not have much to do. They will now give up. They will be trained about different galleries and they will sell the objects of those galleries to visitors. And when they die, because they use the last part of their lives very well, they bequeath. They bequeath some of their estates to the Metropolitan Museum. Those are two examples I'll give you. I have many more to give you. We know and we love listening to them, but thank you so much for giving us these two. Let me move on uh, because um, Dr. Shilon also briefly touched now on sensitization of the public, parents, children. Um, one of the questions um, in the chat was about the subject of history uh, as not being on the curricula anymore. It was in I'm fact sorry. removed in 1987 by Babangida, if I remember correctly. It has been reinstated in 2018, but the problem now is that there are not enough teachers because nobody was going to, uh, to do history at university if nobody was taking it in schools. So this is why I want to ask uh, Mrs. Ajugana, uh, Sheung, if you could comment, you did history, um, what are, the ways that we, uh, for example, as heritage organizations, as people also um, uh, passionate about heritage, how can we help this process? Because it obviously needs time. Okay, great. Um, so I'm just going to add to what Chief Shilon said when he talked about volunteering. So what we can do as museums, private museum, is provide that opportunity, even NCM and provide that opportunity for volunteering. Although Dr. Shina was talking about all the older population in volunteering, uh, we can also have the younger population, uh, secondary schools, 
uh, university level coming to volunteer. That was how I joined Legacy. I was first a student volunteer and that was it. Um, so volunteering, volunteering, volunteering is key. And that's another, that's another quick way of getting manpower into, into the industry, a quick way of developing the workforce for, for. so uh, what the museums can do is provide supplementary opportunities and platforms for uh, schools to, to do this. And once you've gone to sec uh, the primary school or secondary school has, uh, and studied history, now that is being stated, the likelihood of you going to university to study history or anthropology or sociology, whatever uh, related course is then high. Uh, but I think that the museums and other cultural organizations can supplement by providing those platforms. So they see firsthand um, or uh, they have hands-on experience of how that industry works. And then it creates that um, 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 desire to go uh, go further in that. That's, yes. that's my, yeah. Is there any, you, you also mentioned um, the lack of the availability of research and writing about heritage done in Nigeria online. Um, is there also in this creating a, a narrative uh, that connects to more people, is there also a possibility of the uh, online environment to open up the story? Definitely, definitely. Uh, thankfully, right now, really, it's it has to be digital. It has it just has to be digital. Uh, people uh, have more access to um, things online, so it will be good. Again, I call on private organizations, Legacy, uh, uh, 95, LRT, YMC Shillon, to just open up that platform, be more accessible to people. I, I don't know what, what sort of standards we need to put in there, but uh, we should try and put standards that are not too high where we then lose some of this research. So yeah, I, I totally agree with, with that online, um, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Let me move on to the last question, uh, Mr. Enotier Obebor. Um, I, I again uh, put some questions together. There was a question about this research of provenance of uh, the art uh, and the artifacts that should be returned um, and how to, um, uh, to connect uh, the Western museums with the local communities, with the local institutions, so there will be uh, a credible story about those art objects. That's the first question. The other question was, are there in fact also uh, human remains or part of human remains included in those things that were looted? We know of other examples, for example, the Australian ones that, that there were or New Zealand. And is that how, um, how are we thinking of um, uh, receiving those kind <coughs> of objects? Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> most of the um, objects that we are speaking about, uh, about uh, especially from Benin, and I'm aware from other parts of the country, are mostly just um, cultural or objects that are made for traditional worship, or objects that are made um, to record history or memories. So I'm not aware of any human um, remains uh, in that sense. All right. Yeah, so the first question was how to engage in um, um, in a credible um, provenance. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I'm um, a practitioner. I'm a believer in in the in the dating process of artifacts being scientific. I believe that uh, with the scientific methods, the accuracy will be higher. And therefore, in carrying out this provenance research for uh, these artifacts in the various international museums, I will encourage a lot of scientific uh, methods to be used. I will also encourage that um, to tell the stories and the narratives properly, um, experts, scholars, and practitioners on the African, or on the African continent, or from the 
African continent should be uh, engaged and worked closely with in order to get the accurate narratives. Uh, a few of the museums I've been to in Oxford, uh, even in the British Museum, um, displayed some objects and the uh, description cards beside them were not um, very accurate. Uh, this is because there's been no um, long-standing relationship or cooperation with experts from the continent. Okay. Yeah, so that's my belief, yeah. All right, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ogbebor. Um, people are still commenting in the chat. Um, somebody is suggesting, which is great, to make more stamps with interesting uh, artifacts and sites of Nigeria. I think we could add stickers and calendars and all kinds of um, uh, of things. Um, at this point, I think, uh, Mrs. Adeleke, I will return the floor to you. Right. Oh, thank you very much, Femke. Thank you very much for that. Um, yes, so I, I think really, really now we have to um, draw this um, webinar to a close. But before we do that, I just want to say a few words. Um, I would just like to thank all of the panelists so much. I mean, the depth of knowledge is really quite amazing. And, and, I, and I think that there's some very, very positive actions have come out of this because we really did want to say, okay, we are now, we, rather than talking about, oh, how are we gonna get these things back? What, how are we gonna get these things back? It's the action, which is, is really, for me, the, uh, what we have to do on the ground is the most, most difficult aspect of this. And so thank you all to all of the panelists. Thank you, um, Dr. Shillon. Thank you, Barrister Adibi. Thank you, Cheryl, and thank you, Mr. Ennotti. Thank you so much for spending your time and participating in this. It, it's been a very, very, very rich session. And I'd also like to thank, say thank a big thank you to all of the participants who have stayed with us through this fairly lengthy webinar. And I hope that there will be more of this because we need more of this. We need to start having these discussions. I think somebody said that these are the discussions we should have been having years ago and we've been in a better position today. Now all of these things are coming back and now we're having all these um, sort of uh, collaborations with universities all around the world. We've been in a better position, better prepared if we had started this conversation long ago, but at least we are starting it now. Um, I think, you know, finally, my final comments um, would be, I mean, I don't know whether to go round, I think maybe if, if there's still time, I mean, I, I would really like to go, I, I'm no, I'm, let me not go round to the panelists again, because I, I think, you know, we, 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 we are running out of time, but I would just like to, to I was going to ask the question, where should all of our key efforts be concentrated? Um, um, I don't know. I mean, Femke, do we have a bit of time to just quickly go around for one final comment from the panelists? On my can account, we, can, we do. Can we do that? Okay, right. So please make it short and sweet, right? Short and sweet. Where should our key efforts, efforts by Nigerians, be concentrated towards protection of heritage? Where should the key efforts be concentrated? Okay, I'm going to start with um, uh, Sharon very, very quickly. Okay, um, workforce development. Uh, we need to start training, we need to start learning, we need to start doing things, writing them down, best practices, case studies, trying to, and then again, like I said, volunteering. Let's start opening the floor for people to come in and see what it is. Okay. Um, and that's Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, Dr. Shillong, where should we concentrate our main effort now? Very short and sweet, please. Final we comment. Concentrate our, F, our main effort from talking and doing. We should start doing. And we should learn to be selfless. We, we talk too much and we are too selfish by nature. We expect others to do things. We don't ask ourselves, what have you done for the common interests? I think that's all I would say. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Enoti, where should we concentrate our ma main effort? Short and sweet. Well, <clears throat> I think uh, the first 
the, the main efforts should be in development of infrastructure. Because um, once you have the infrastructure, you have the museums, you have the buildings, you have the infrastructure, then you can, because you can't do tourism without infrastructure. You need the hotels, you need the institutions that will cater for tourism. Yeah, so everything else can follow. Thank you. So Mr. Um, Adebi, short and sweet, where should we concentrate our main effort? I think by doing what we are doing now, we have already started. It is the elites in all societies, even in Europe, in the 16th centuries, in the 16th century and all in their history, it is the elites that supported arts that encouraged artists, that the, the Michelangelo, whoever, who are supported by the elites. Now people see arts here, culture here as fetish. If elites of this caliber discuss, talking about it in the press, in the television, I mean, this kind of discussions in the newspapers, that this is not fetish, you know, people will go with them. Then people will take more interest in the museums. So please let us keep on doing what we are doing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to make a last comment now. I feel that we should seek inspiration from our pre-colonial history. We have to do our own research. We have to tell our own stories. We can reap so many rewards from this current wave of interest. There's a lot of interest now. And so it should be used as a catalog, cat sorry, a catalyst for change. Um, within the heritage structure, just beyond, you know, just the return of, it's more than just getting back treasures. It's much more than that. I mean, the Benin dialogue was international. We need national and local dialogues around funding, skills, research, expertise, curriculum change, leadership issues. And also finally, I think this is something that everybody has more or less said, we have to remove the fear of exploring our pre-colonial traditional cultures and religions. So on that note, I'm gonna say goodbye to everybody and thank you so much. And I think, you know, everybody can just unmute and say goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank bye. you, everybody. Nice goodbye, to see you. Goodbye. 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 No. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Please, let's stay in contact. Definitely. 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 Yeah. We will. Okay. We will. Thank you so much.